Washington State University. Go Cougs! We're going to talk philosophy today. Not only hard, hard information about what we actually use and deploy, but why we use it and what it means. Because that's a big chunk of how you can actually build these kinds of systems. And so today, um, we're going to talk about some sensor theory. Uh, this is something that you don't have initially got. Most of the time, people say, use the sensor. Here you go, is motion sensors is on or off. But there's more to it than that. Uh, there's a lot of things under, underneath. We're going to talk about models and the mental frameworks that we use and, the, and how that leads into digital frameworks, what AI and machine learning actually do. We're going to talk about the categories of sensing. What can we sense? What does it mean? What are, what are the things that go on and what is possible with these frameworks? The examples of common some choices that we make, what did we choose versus what are some other options out in the, in the field, and various conclusions. And then I have about 20 more slides hiding behind that in case we have a lot of time, and we won't. Um, so we'll see. So <clears throat> starting out, let's talk some theory. Um, in their core essence, when you really say, what is a sensor? They really do one thing. They sample. They look at the universe, they pull in some one or more pieces of data about it, and you end up with a sample of it as it stands at that moment. Because even when you talk about cameras that, hey, I got a video of the last 10 seconds, it's made of what? Images. Images. It's a whole series of frames, samples as they were. It's like taking a camera and just going at high speed. When you compress it, it all smears together. But in the start, it was a whole series of samples. And so what you're saying is the state of the universe was currently some value, x. And when you're doing that sampling, your sensor needs to follow some rules. They need to be good at this. You want it to be sensitive to the property you're trying to measure. So if, for example, you have a humidity sensor that doesn't read humidity, it's not a very good sensor. Um, it then needs to be insensitive to other properties of the universe. So if I have a humidity sensor that does pull in humidity, but its value goes up and down when the wind blows, that's not necessarily a very good sensor. So it needs to be insensitive to other things as best as possible. And you can't influence the measured property. So when you actually take your sample, you don't want to change the state of the universe because that's not very good. This is why quantum systems are very difficult to measure because measuring them does change their state by definition, but we're not doing that. <laughs> so in our case, if you measure the humidity, you, it shouldn't do something like spray a bunch of water in the room and change the humidity. <laughs> it just should measure it. Now, in the base form, there's some, there's some basic issues here. Noise, when you do your sampling, when, for example, if you're measuring if someone's in the room and there's a person and your sensor says, yes, there's a person and there is a person, that is your true positive state. That is very correct. If it says there's no one in the room and there's no one there, that's good. That's your true negative. That's when it's false and false. The problem is if it says that there's a person in the room and there's no one there, a false positive. That is your type 1 error. It says there's someone there and there's no one around. And our sensors do that sometimes. Our motion detectors sometimes pull it, say motion and there's no motion because what they're measuring isn't necessarily what you think. And we'll talk about that a little bit. This doesn't happen very often because they're pretty good, but it does happen. Um, Kyoto's, uh, the, the baseboard heaters are notorious for this. When they turn on, they generate this plume of heat. And our sensors are actually looking at thermal values. They're looking at changes in temperature. Well, when the baseboard kicks on and a big plume of heat goes by, that's a change in temperature. And it will say, there's a person there. It'll actually, it'll say, there's, a there's motion. And there's no actual motion from our implications. So we end up with a, with a false positive. Otherwise, if there's a person there and they say false, there's no person there. That's a false, uh, a false negative. So in that case, wh when does this happen in our homes? Hmm? A couple times. Either the sensor's dead because the battery has died and it's not saying anything, uh, 
which means there's a person there and it doesn't say there's anybody around, or you're holding still. If you hold still, the motion sensor will turn off and you're still there. So our logic in our sensors are actually kind of true positive and possibly false negative something. It's kind of fuzzy. Or it actually can be either one of these when it says off. And so that's a problem from building logic systems based around our motion detectors. And the other thing is you can actually get um, bad values in the form of magnitudes. So a humidity sensor, if it says it's 50% humidity, but the room is actually 75, you, you're looking at how, how far off you are. And so given that sensors can be wrong, you need to know how you're going to handle this. Because you're going to ask questions like, how are we going to validate to know how much they're wrong? How, this is where we get into the idea of ground truth. And we talk about this in a lot of our data. We'll say, how are we going to get ground truth? And this is why we start doing things like asking the resident, what were you doing? Was anyone home? What activity were you doing? Because they're the ground truth. They're the, they're the entity that actually knows what's happening. Um, you can also use multiple of the same sensor. So if, for example, we have three humidity sensors and two say 50%, one says 70%, it's probably 50%. You can check them against each other. You can use different kinds of sensors. This is actually very common when you're trying to figure out the error of a given new device you're using. So if we bring in a new humidity sensor and we go, go to the lab of atmospheric processing and bring in one of their giant systems that do incredibly high accurate humidity sensing and we run them both in the same room at the same time, you can see how, how off the new cheapo little $3 sensor we're using is compared to their $10,000 machine and say, OK, well, the percentage is about this much. It's, it's off. But we'll be able to know because we're cross-checking with a different kind of sensor. And that also leads into the higher resolution sensing, or especially in lab scenarios, where you can take it into a very controlled environment and test it in a place that you truly know. Altogether, there's a lot of ways sensors can be wrong. They can deviate in many ways. Just plain old sensitivity, just giving you the incorrect output. That's cheap sensors will do that. Um, things like even, even time crystals will do that. It'll be off by some percentage because it's just a low quality piece of hardware. Um, the range of the sensor can be wrong. For example, I was using an accelerometer in a rocket. And the accelerometer was set to two Gs as 100% acceleration. Well, guess what? Rockets go higher than two Gs when they launch. Oh, we were doing about 12. So that sensor was unable to measure the full range of what we, the environment it was seeing in. It was in. I eventually had to dig down to the libraries and actually change the underlying driver to allow it to handle a full range. I was pretty pleased with myself in the end. But that was kind of fun. Um, bias, if, you, if your input's supposed to be zero, but it still outputs a value, so if humidity is supposed to be zero and it gives you five, uh, then you know you're just plain old off. Your sensor will be off some amount. Um, if your sensitivity is nonlinear, it actually instead of being linear with the humidity, it's actually a curve with the humidity, you get nonlinear behaviors. If, if the environment is changing too quickly for the sensor to, de to detect it, you can end up with dynamic errors because the rapid changes. If your sensor just drifts over time, uh, for whatever reason, it, as it gets older, that can happen. Uh, even if things are holding still, its value just drifts away. Uh, accelerometers are bad for this. If you're using dead reckoning, and there's just a little tiny error every time it samples, it can look like your robot is shifting across the room very slowly. Um, you're drifting over time. Um, you can have plain old noise. This happens. The sensor just gives you the wrong data. Um, you can get lag error by when the input is flopping back and forth. If you're shaking it back and forth, you can get, because it's not always picking that up. Uh, if you're going from analog to digital values, analog is, is wonderful because it will give you high, high degree of accuracy, but digital has a, a maximum fidelity amount because it's binaries. It's got a binary value somewhere. Um, you will lose data in that, in that conversion. Uh, and then also, if you're not sampling often enough, 
So for example, you're sampling every second, but things are every changing every quarter second. You'll miss some of the samples. So, uh, and then also if the sensor itself has environmental impact errors. My favorite so far was when we put on a house, uh, it was a wind, we put a window sensor, it had to go on the outside of the window, and it blew off. <laughs> so it was not sensing the window. <laughs> and that was an environmental issue. Um, it's kind of a large scale one, but that's what can happen. You don't know what you're sensing. It was still talking to the network, it was just on the ground. <laughs> and we left it there for about three months. Um, but it's okay. Um, so given that you finally figure out how good your sensors are, get them in place, measure the right thing, be insensitive to everything else, handle all the possible kinds of error, and you get a sample, what does it mean? You have to interpret that data. There, there's different things it can mean. So if we get a temperature sensor and it says 40, what does that mean? Is that too hot? Is that too cold? Who, who thinks it's too cold? Okay, is it a hot number or is it a cold number? Anyone? Dude, there's no wrong answer here because it depends entirely on whether you're in Fahrenheit Celsius or Kelvin. <laughs> if it's in Kelvin, you're in trouble. Um, depends if you are in the room or not. But um, you need to be able to understand that units do matter, keeping track of that. What, it, what does the, that data sample really tell you? And understanding what you're looking at and what the sensor is going to output is important. 